think last week we looked here at how don't be surprised if persecution comes. And of course, Jesus told them that the Comforter would be with them, the Holy Ghost. And he's come to convict the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment, and how we need in our generation a mighty move of the Spirit of God. They enter the arena again. God has lifted folks, no doubt about it. And Ezekiel tells us three times when God lifted from Jerusalem. You see, God pressed himself at the temple. Um, he pressed himself at the tabernacle in Moses' day. He pressed himself at the temple in Solomon's day. But because of their disobedience and wickedness, God was lifted. And this is, I believe, this is the situation, sad to say, in the United Kingdom, including this province at this particular time. How we need the power of God again to descend to the Spirit. He is breathed, he is quenched, to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. If he doesn't intervene, our land is finished, folks. They have suppressed the truth. They have totally rebelled. Oh, it is a very serious thing. God moves on, you see, from one nation to another. John 16, as we look here tonight at verse 12, again, the Lord speaking to them, his disciples, the eleven Judas, as went now and betrayed the Lord, of course. And he's just uh, in the upper room giving them this discourse to encourage them, to strengthen them because he's ready to depart, to go to the Lord's assembly and then go to the cross. So we're John 16, verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you. Jesus is speaking, of course, to his disciples here. But you cannot bear them now. I wait when he, the Spirit of truth, as the Holy Ghost has come. <coughs> he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. You see, that is the office of the Spirit. We have saw the same many charismatic Pentecostal circles, they're glorifying the Spirit instead of glorifying Christ. The office of the Spirit is to glorify Christ. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father are of are mine, therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. And we'll just end at verse 15 in our reading tonight. And will the Lord will bless his inerrant, perfect, glorious, indestructible word to us this evening. Out of all the books published and printed in our modern technological age, the Bible is still the best selling book of all time. Now whether people just buy the Bible or are intrigued by it and curious by it, there's many people who have the Bible in their homes and it's just dust on it. It's not been applied. And of course, some people even have superstition think to have the Bible in the home is going to bring a blessing to them, but they don't even use it or apply it. And as the Lord tells us, it's not the person who even reads the Bible will enter the kingdom, it's the person who applies the word of God, a doer, not a hearer, but a doer. The Bible remains truly unique from any other book. On all the millions and millions and millions of books which have been published down through the history of mankind, the Bible remains truly unique. It never changes. It's eternal. As it alone is the word of God, inspired by the Spirit of God with no flaws in it. The Bible is pure. We looked at this morning the importance of God's word in 1 Peter chapter 2. The Bible is infallible. 
And there's no mistakes with it. It is inert. It is eternal. It is indestructible. It is authoritative. It is sufficient. It is effective as it is able to make us wise in the salvation. This book, dear friends, is the most authoritative book in history and always will be. We stand. Bring anyone back to the book. Don't get sidetracked. If you get into a discussion with someone, bring them to the book. This is the authority. The King James Version of the Bible consists of 783,137 words. God honours and places his word very high above everything else, which we touched on this morning. This is incredible in Psalm 138. God says, referring to his word, about the psalmist says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. That is how precious and important God's word is to God, that he's even magnified it above his name and above every name. The value of the Bible is unsurpassed. It is all truth from the beginning to the end. And every single person will be judged by this book. The Bible is a light. The Bible is a lamp. The Bible sanctifies us. The Bible cleanses us. The Bible brings comfort. It encourages us. It creates faith within us. It challenges us. It gives us wisdom. It gives us spiritual food. The Bible is to believe. It is to be obeyed. The Bible is to be studied. The Bible is to be honoured. And the Bible is to be defended. The Bible is a defence against sin. It's a defence against temptation. It's a defence against deception. And the scriptures remind us, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. All scripture is by inspiration of God. As the New Testament writers quote, quoted the Old Testament passages more than 300 times in the New Testament. The Bible interprets itself, you say, old and new. The Bible is suitable and more than sufficient for all generations, as it is always up to date and beyond, as it is a book of, with such perfect precision. It is the eternal book. It covers past, it covers present, it covers future. The Bible does not change for society, but society needs to change for the Bible. The Bible has remarkable unity, which was written over a period of approximately 1600 years by around 40 authors inspired by the Holy Ghost. This is where I'm coming from in a minute of this sermon. Who is the Spirit of Truth? Verse 13 a, it says, How be it when he, the Spirit of Truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit, you see, is the author of this book. The Spirit of God took kings, he took prophets, he took priests, physicians, shepherds, fishermen, statesmen, tax collectors, soldiers, scribes, theologians, farmers, such widely diverse backgrounds, yet no contradictions, but great precision, precision harmony and accuracy is God's word and way is always perfect. When God's word is elevated and pursued and revered, and respected and also applied a nation shall be blessed blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord Psalm 33 I'm going to repeat that when God's word is elevated God's word is sought after God's word is precious God's word is revered God's word is respected God's word is applied then a nation shall be blessed God will shine his face upon that nation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. When Israel of old, they were given conditional circumstances and when they obeyed, they were without an excuse. The king of Israel, there was 42 kings in, in the, regarding from Saul, even when his kingdom was split. 
split the northern and the southern. It was split after Solomon. There was Saul, there was David, there was Solomon, and then the list was right there. And there was only about eight good kings out of them. But nevertheless, every single king in Israel was given a copy of the Bible, and they were meant to shape their own lives as well as the kingdom, the, the nation of Israel, by the word of God. But sadly, the mass majority ignored it. But when David reigned, See, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And when David reigned, because David was a man after God's own heart, he had his flaws, of course, those heinous sins he committed, but consistently, um, it was a pattern of his life. David loved the Lord. He loved his word. In fact, David was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write almost half the Psalms. And Israel was a blessed nation. God gave them victory over all the enemies. It was the golden age. The borders were extended. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You see, David put the Lord first. And his desire was for the nation of Israel to worship God. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. David put the word of God first. But the contrary to this is when God's word is neglected, when God's word is mocked, when God's word is belittled, when God's word is suppressed, a nation shall be judged. And dear friends, Romans 1, read Romans 1 and you go home. You will see the parallelism in our nation right now with Romans 1. And God is given it over to judgment. God, you see, when God's word is suppressed in our nation, our province, as far as say this small province, they have suppressed the word of God. And the Bible reminds us the wicked shall be turned into hell on all the nations that forget God. When a nation apostatizes, or when an individual apostatizes, and I do fear, dear friends, I was talking to Jim earlier, even this morning about it, there's people who have come into this church and they've heard the word of God faithfully expounded. They know they need to be saved and they've left this church. And I was listening to a sermon there through the week about the sin on the death. There's a sin on the death. And dear friends, I do fear for them. I really do. Because of the apostatized, they've been cut off by God and they'll never be saved. God has given them over. They've turned their back on the truth of God's word. They've walked out of this assembly because it's not their nose or the joint, the truth of God's word. You see, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. I wonder tonight, and I trust everyone in this meeting tonight has submitted, has humbly submitted and allowed the word of God to transform and govern your life. So this morning, the way you treat the word of God is the way you treat Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is the word. Thank God he's a God of revelation. God is a God of revelation. First of all, we have general revelation. Romans 1 again. They, they should know there's a God out there by the creation around him. David reminds us the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. That's general revelation. Man and woman is without an excuse, even if God didn't even give us his precious word. Yet man is without an excuse and woman because God has designed us, he's given us a conscience, and he's given us the creation around us that we should know with the great the greatness of the creation, even though it's a fallen creation, but it was perfect when God made it. Man brought sin into it, and it's a fallen creation, but nevertheless it still is mind blown, the complexities of it and how it all connects. And how it all fits together and how it all works is because of God the Creator sustains it and He upholds it with the word of His power. So every single one in the judgment day will be without an excuse even if they say, I am destroyed for lack of knowledge. I don't know about this book. It makes no difference. You're going to be judged by it anyway because they, by creation they should have knew there was a God out there. You see, God's a God of revelation, general revelation. 
creation, but also the special revelation of the Word of God. The mercy and the goodness of God given us in this book that shows us the way of salvation. The entrance of thy word giveth light, the psalm says. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. But also God is a God of illumination and inspiration by the Holy Spirit. Verse 13 of our text tonight, chapter 16 of John, verse 13. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He's a God of not just revelation but illumination, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall but show you things to come. 14b, and shall show it unto you. So he's a God of illumination. He helps us understand this revelation of his, the word of God. The mark of a good teacher, of course, is given the right, right amount of truth at the best time. The Holy Spirit knows all our capacities and teaches us the truths we need to know, especially in our quiet times every day. I trust. When we need them and when we are ready to receive them. There is no point giving people strong meat when they are not prepared for it, babes in Christ. The elementary ABCs. But nevertheless, dear friends, you don't hit the bricks of a congregation just because maybe someone isn't making much progress in their spiritual walk and the rest are. You need to get the right bonds. It is incredible the structure and the format of God's Word. This is why expository preaching, I believe, is the correct way of handling God's Word. These verses, dear friends, the, the structure and the format of this Word is for a reason. And even here in this passage, you're going to see it. It's incredible the format, the structure of God's Word. How the Holy Spirit would remind the disciples what Jesus had taught them in the four Gospels. Don't forget the New Testament was not written at this time. On John 14 verse 26, Jesus said to the disciples, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in thy name, he shall teach you all things. This was the four Gospels. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. This was Jesus' ministry for over the three years with him. Jesus said the Comforter would speak, he would teach, he would bring all to the remembrance to these disciples who heard the teachings of Jesus, which of course incorporates the four Gospels. But to go even further, the structure of God's Word, how right? the Spirit it. it didn't stop there with four Gospels. But also the Holy Spirit would guide them, the Apostles now, into all truth. And this would result in the Epistles. You see the structure from the Gospels to the Epistles now. Verse 13a, how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. And also the Holy Spirit would show the disciples the things to come. Which refers, of course, to the prophetic scriptures. So we have the Gospels, we have the Epistles, and now the prophetic scriptures, especially the book of Revelation, verse 13c, and he will show you things to come. And this came to pass. Jesus' words were fulfilled. Jesus told them the Holy Spirit would teach them and bring things to their remembrance. But Jesus taught them during his ministry for over three years. But Jesus also told them that he would guide them into all truth. And this resulted in the epistles. And Jesus also taught them that he would show them things to come in the Holy Spirit. And these are the prophetic scriptures like the book of Revelation. 
After three years of Jesus teaching him and instructing his disciples during his public ministry, it is surprising at first glance that the Lord would still have many more things to say to his disciples. In verse 12a, I have yet many things to say unto you. But why did he not say more things to them what they still needed to know? The reason being is in 12b, but you cannot bear them now. First of all, they have been overcome with sorrow. Sorrow have filled your heart. In verse 6b of the same chapter, it says, Sorrow have filled your heart. So there's no point the Lord overloading them with stuff, more stuff. They were sorrowful. And it's wise, dear friends, at times when we use our discretion to speak in the right manner, in the right time, regarding the right situation. A word in season, in other words. Don't inundate, don't inundate a person with bad news to crush them even more if they are already feeling weak and downcast. There is a time and a place for everything. You see, these disciples, the Lord knew there was sorrow, they were downcast, they were downtrodden, downcast, they had sorrow in their heart. So the Lord says, You cannot bear anything else. I tell you here in verse 12, there's a time and a place for everything. And dear friends, when a carnal professing believer, while they're ever in, God knows. Leaves a local fellowship, while it's this fellowship, while it's the Baptist, while it's the Free Peas, we all get it. Whoever it is in this town or any town, all over the world, it's the same principle. When a pure old professing believer leaves a local fellowship with ill feeling, the minister does not need to hear the negative, false, critical feedback about himself or others in the fellowship. It is not possible, it is actually possible. But also, a more important reason than their sorrow, why Jesus did not give them more information, was because of their ignorance, slow learning, especially regarding the vast significance of the cross, the resurrection, on the ascension before those events took place in verse 12 jesus says i have yet many things to say unto you but you cannot bear them now they were sorrowful they were downcast there was no point giving them any any worse news they weren't in the right frame of mind to handle it but even worse was reporting this the vast significance. A number of hours later, the Lord would be arrested, go to that cross, be crucified, and then three days later, be resurrected, which he told them, of course, the three times he told them this would happen. But they didn't grasp it, they didn't chew on it, they didn't understand it. They were still in ignorance, they were slow learning. The disciples, you see, had viewed their Messiah even up to that point. They had viewed their Messiah as a political and military deliverer, expecting him to drive out the Roman occupation out of Israel and deliver them to restore Israel's national sovereignty and bring in the Messianic kingdom. This is what the Jews are waiting on tonight, folks. This is what the Orthodox Jews are waiting on. Even the disciples thought, they even asked, Lord, James and John, where are we, where are we can we sit back beside you in, our, in the kingdom? You see, they were waiting on the, as we call it, the millennial kingdom, the messianic kingdom, the kingdom of righteousness, the kingdom of peace, the kingdom of prosperity, the kingdom in which righteousness will prevail. To the Jews' mindset then and right up to now, if they would only read Daniel, if they would only read Isaiah, if they would only read the prophets, 
Yet there, there were great thinkers that would lose you some of them in the Old Testament, no doubt about it, the scribes. But yet in their blindness, this is why it's a supernatural work, even though they're highly intelligent, far more intelligent than me, far more intelligent than you, the majority of them are intelligent people, and yet they cannot see yet to this day that Jesus Christ is the Messiah because it's a spiritual work through the Holy Ghost. And to this day, it is absolutely inconceivable, monstrous in their Jewish mindset, that their Messiah, the Son of David, would die on the cross. If you were in Israel tonight with me and we tried to get caught in an Orthodox Jew, in fact, they wouldn't even give you any time. But if you did get into the discussion with them and you said about Jesus Christ as the Messiah, he died on the cross, it would absolutely cut you in two. There's still a blindness of them until the times of the Gentiles will be wrapped up and then God will deal with them again. They could not grasp at that point even the disciples. You see, it was a Jewish mindset. They were waiting on this great, the, the great deliverer to deliver them from Rome, the Roman occupation, the Roman Empire. They, wanted, they thought he was going to be the military deliverer. The crushing. They could not grasp at that point of the spiritual significance, the greatest victory of all. The concept of a dying Messiah who came to conquer sin. You see, sin destroys us, sin separates us from God. Sin, no sin will ever happen. Sin always must be dealt with, which always leads to death, physical and spiritual death. And they could not grasp the spiritual significance, the concept of a dying Messiah who came to conquer sin and death and the devil by becoming an all sufficient, atoning, substitutionary sacrifice. Praise his wonderful name. But thank God the Lord is long suffering, tender, very patient with us. And Jesus did not stop there with these disciples. But inform them and encourage them, his disciples, to a greater extent of revelation they would experience through Christ's representative, the Holy Spirit, in verse 13a. How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Without the Holy Spirit, dear friends, people cannot be saved. Without the Holy Spirit, dear friends, people cannot understand this book. Without the Holy Spirit, you see, they're all, they're blinded. It's a spiritual work. The devil is blinded. Their sin is blinded. The things of this world is blinded. They're dead spiritually. This is why they need resurrection life. This is why they need regeneration through the Spirit. Without them, they'll die in their sin. Blinded. Thank God for the Holy Ghost who dwells with us. The greatest the touchstone in our Bible studies over the months in Corinthians, even the wisdom of this word, even the great thinkers in Oxford, the great professors in Oxford tonight in Cambridge. Dear friends, a, 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 a child of God might even be that grounded in the word of God and have certainly not got the mind they have, and yet they're in a better position than they. They have more life because the Spirit of God dwells within them. So the Holy Spirit here, the Lord says, He was given them greater extent of revelation because the Holy Spirit would come and be their representative. How great when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, Jesus says to these disciples. The angel of Christ further revelation to his disciples would be the Holy Spirit who would guide them into all truth, who is the author of all truth, the precious word of God. The Holy Spirit reveals, glorifies Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, the one who is full of grace and truth. The opposite of truth, of course, is lies, and Satan is the father of lies, and he has the nations deceived by his lies. And I touched on it this morning, all lies will enter the kingdom. Or will not enter the kingdom of God with the light of fire. 
Lies is an abomination unto the Lord, and the opposite of truth is lies, and Satan will inspire all types of deception to undermine, to twist the truth, using vain imaginations, vain philosophies, vain doctrines, vain programs, the list can go on, etc., etc. Only the Holy Spirit, who is God, knows all that God knows, and so is qualified to reveal divine truth to mankind. It is impossible for the Holy Spirit to inspire error. It's impossible. The Holy Spirit is truth. It's impossible for the Holy Spirit to inspire error. And I believe if a person is truly converted by the grace of God, the Lord will lead that person out of heretical false teaching as the Spirit's office, we looked at last week, is to convict and guide you into all truth. If a person remains under false heretical teaching, a false teacher, you need to question their salvation because how can someone sit under false, a false gospel, false heretical teaching when the Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth? How can it sit under lies because if it sit under lies and if they're truly born of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God will check them, the Spirit of God will be grieved. And the Word of God tells us, of course, come out from among them and be you separate. What fellowship of lightness with darkness? Paul speaking to his young associate Timothy, who was a pastor at Ephesus, he says this, I charge these strong words. I charge thee, therefore, preach the word, be it instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they hate to themselves. Teachers having itching ears, false teachers, in other words, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. People who are in the flesh go to the church to what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. These false teachers who are promoting sodomy, who embrace so-called, it's not a marriage from the biblical point of view, same-sex so-called marriage, it's not marriage. Now they're even, now going to try and uh, brush out husband and wife, not politically correct. This is the so-called Methodist church, by the way, folks. And many others are going along with them. I fear for so many, I really do. Under the sound of expounded sound teaching and have left congregations and they went to a wee tickling ear church to feed their flesh. There's a sin on the death there friends. God gives them over. It's known as apostasy. No hope. They'll die in their sin first. Serious business we're dealing with. And people will go and they listen to these wee, Paul says it in Romans 16, these wee first speeches to fill their own belly. These false teachers, it's only a job to them, a career to them. Instead of preaching the truth of God's word, it's just the wee sentimental, emotional speeches. John reminds us, test the spirits. What does he mean by that? Test what someone's preaching from this book. If they're not faithful to this book, they're a false teacher, according to God's word. He says there's many. And of course, if you love someone, you will tell them the truth. Especially the word of God. As there is no higher truth which is inspired by the spirit of truth, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is compatible with his book. 
The Holy Ghost is never divorced from his book. The Holy Ghost is never divorced from Jesus Christ to have the preeminence as he shall testify and glorify Christ and is known as the Spirit of Truth. Where the Holy Ghost is at work, there must be truth, no falsehood, no manipulations. John Fletcher, Wesley said, he was the most godliest man ever met in his life. What a testimony. John Fletcher says, speak boldly and speak truly. Shame the devil. Spurgeon, the great Baptist minister, says, opinions alter, but truth certified by God can no more change than God who uttered it. You see, dear friends, Scripture is the most precious treasure given so that the people of God may be adequate, equipped, competent, strengthened in their faith under every good work. No further revelation is required as God's word is more than sufficient. In fact, if any person tries to add to this precious book, they will be severely judged, Revelation 22. So the Lord's promise has now come to pass regarding its primary function that the Holy Spirit shall guide you into all truth regarding the apostles and the New Testament writers. But now in the church age, which we're in at this present time, the secondary cause of the Holy Spirit's work office is illumination to the saints, the bride of Christ. You see, the Holy Spirit gave the apostles revelation. As our faith is grounded in the apostles' doctrine. But now the Spirit gives his church, the bride of Christ, illumination. Verse 13, eh, how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Finally, include here, we discover the, the gold of the Holy Spirit's revelation. The gold of the Holy Spirit's revelation. Verse 13, leave. Says, for he shall not speak of himself. You see, he will glorify Christ. But whatsoever he shall hear, the Spirit of God, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father have are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. The goal of the Holy Spirit's revelation. When the Lord Jesus walked on this earth, he did not act on his own initiative, but always submitted to the Father's will. Likewise, the Holy Spirit, just like the Son, always acted in complete harmony with the Father. Completely, the Holy Spirit is consistent with God's revealed will, this book, the Scriptures, and will never violate the principles of God's Word for anyone or any system. Verse 13b, But whatsoever he shall hear, Jesus speaking about the Holy Ghost, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Any person, no matter how popular they are, who claims that the Spirit of God has prompted him or her to do certain things, but is contrary to the example of Christ or the teaching of this Word, the Word of God, are greatly mistaken, deceived, and are being led by another Spirit. In other words, are being led by Satan. The Spirit of God will never, ever be contrary to His Word. He's always compatible with the Word. Satan does not care what activities people are involved in as long as they are not doing God's will. The Holy Spirit does not inspire anyone to manufacture a different seeker friendly message but honours the Word alone. Which points to Jesus Christ, of course. That is why I believe, dear friends, preachers need to get back to preaching the word in an expository fashion. Lloyd Jones says when revivals came and the Bible on the day, it's when they get back to preaching the Bible, expository what's said, verse by verse. 
are spread in the passage what the Bible says. Not what social events say. It's not hard to make up social events. Pull on your TV tomorrow or your internet and your phone or whatever. We know the Lord's getting worse. It's not difficult to understand that. We preach the Bible, dear friends, not the Lord's events. When Lloyd Jones, when the Great War, when the Great War of World War II was and London was being hammered by the bombs. What did Lloyd Jones, Lloyd Jones do, the great expositor? He didn't tell them about what's going on outside. He told what he did to the believers to build them up in their faith that they'd be prepared for outside. Was he expounded God's word through the epistles to sanctify them even more? We need to get back to the book and preach the book. Too much fleshly preaching out there today. Which is only opinion to the flesh. Not politics. We see what politics done on preaching down through the years of this long. Our stories. Go to the bar of the night in Bomb Bridge. There's men and women to tell the stories and you can listen to them for hours, storytellers. Paul, George, Timothy, preach the book. Preach the Bible, what it says in the context. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to enrich the redeemed with the treasures of God's truth, dear friends. Not about what's happening around us. The word of banks, we know what's happening. Is it a great revelation or something? The Bible tells us 2,000 years ago through John. John says the more life and wickedness is a hard to work out. You see, the word of God is a rich mind of gold, silver, and precious jewels. And what a joy it is when the Spirit illuminates the word to us. As we study the word to get to know the God of the word by the glorified Christ. And know the victory there is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, 14. He, the Holy Spirit, shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. I've almost finished one page. The Holy Spirit's ministry is to glorify Christ. It is Christ centered, it is Christ honoring, it is Christ exalting. As he does not point to himself but to the Son of God. Verse 14 a, He shall glorify me, Jesus says. Just the way Jesus glorified the Father when he walked this earth, the Spirit of God will glorify the Son. And this, dear friend, sadly, with this explosion in 1904 of chaos, so many of these wonderful gifts came to the church again. What did it do then for 1900 years? Were these men not used by any Charles Spurgeon? Or Wesley's or Whitfield? Did they not have the gifts? No, they did they not fill with the Spirit. And yet these chaos, absolute confusion today. That some groups, especially these Pentecostal, hyper Pentecostals, they miss the point of the ministry of the Holy Ghost, which is they're so caught up and focused on the gifts and the blessings of the Holy Spirit rather than the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying some of them aren't saved, they are saved. But they're an error in that point. Folks, there's no shortcuts regarding Christ's glory, which are revealed on the pages of Scripture, in which the Holy Spirit uses to sanctify Christ's pride and mold, change him from glory to glory, so we will be conformed to the image of his glorious Son. God, you see, is truth. God is honest. God is faithful. God is transformed to his children who never manipulate, never manipulates with any hidden agenda, but is a God of revelation, a God of illumination, a God of inspiration through the office ministry of the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher, guide, comforter, who points us to the blessed Lord Jesus Christ. That is his ministry. And yet people are trying to seek these experiences, the gift of tongues. What benefit 
today if somebody came into this assembly and so called had the gift of tongues, what benefit would that be to me or you? Nothing. On the so called gift of healing, there was a perfect opportunity there in this so called COVID years. Why weren't they in the Royal Victoria Hospital? Why weren't they in Craig Allen Hospital? Healing everybody around them with this so called gift. It's a delusion. A sham. Folks, they were not the apostles. The apostles were given great grace because it was the beginning of the early church. Just like Elijah, it was a new beginning. Just like Moses, it was a new beginning. They were given miraculous grace to do miracles. Now, I'm not saying God can do what he can do. But there's so much confusion out there regarding the Holy Ghost. He's grave, dear friends. He's quenched. We need to be sensitive. We need to be filled. We need to walk. And when we're walking in the Spirit, and when we're being filled with the Spirit, we're not making provision to the flesh. And as a result, when we're doing that, the Spirit of God will reveal Christ even more and more to us. And our lives will reflect Jesus Christ more and more to our loved ones, to our neighbours, to our work, work colleagues, to bring glory to his wonderful name. As we are joint heirs with him. Verse 15. All things that the Father have have for mine is incredible. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Everything Christ has, we have in Christ. It's all about Christ, dear friends. The Paul preached. Paul preached Christ and him crucified. The apostles preached Christ's death, <coughs> resurrection and ascension through the power of the Spirit. Oh, how we need to revive. How we need to be filled in these days. How we need to get back to this precious book in which the Holy Spirit is the author, in which the Holy Spirit will honor. Thank God he dwells with us. There's a lot of things I've said tonight that I didn't even mean to say, but whatever way it was, it is. But thank God we keep going. His grace is sufficient, and he never leaves us nor forsake us. His spirit will remain the true people of God forever. The eternal spirit. And he will glorify Christ. May God bless his word to us this evening. Thank you so much, folks. I went on and said, there's nearly 44 paths. So we'll just sing a couple of verses by now as we can clearly. Three, two, six.